Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, our webinar today. Um, the material I'll be covering today is what we at Wilson Tool think a new punch press engineer would need to know to get started and successfully do their job. So today, I will be presenting as if I am the, uh, talking to your new operator, and hopefully you can then use this webinar again in the future when you bring on new employees or perhaps cross-train someone else in your shop. So let's get started. Table of contents. Today we're going to be talking about the introduction of tooling, selecting the right tool, forming tools, and maintaining tools. In this section, we will go over the mechanics of punch tooling. There are four parts to the guide assembly, the spring pack, the punch body, the guide, and stripper. With the spring pack assembly in the small stations, which are the half inch and inch and a quarter, the spring pack type can vary based on the type of tools you own. In early generations of tooling, the spring pack needs to be removed to add shims to the tool after it is sharpened. With HP design tools, this is a shimless design, and with a turn and click, adjustment is made to the tool after sharpening. Our latest HP2 spring packs have external adjustment features that allow you not to have to disassemble the tools. What we have here in the spring pack photos, as I mentioned earlier in the early generation, as in this design here, this tool here would need to have a shim applied to this location on this shoulder of the punch, which is right there. After you sharpen the tool, the spring pack would have to be removed, such as removing the screw, uh, the head nut screw here, removing the spring and the lifter spring, applying the shim, assembling all of this area back together, and then remeasuring the tool from here to here. It's a time consuming effort, but it is uh, a generation of tooling that a lot of customers have. The next design is the HP tool. HP has a preloaded spring pack for consistent stripping and also allows for the turn and click adjustability of your punches. This tool over here is our HP design tool. This tool here has an external adjustment. This knob here rotates uh, back and forth at five thousandths per increment, which allows for the fastest setup and adjustment of your tools. Punch types. Each of you have different punch types throughout your shop. I'm sure some of you have full body punches. These full body punches run from the length of the tool from top to bottom. And they're either metric design or inch design. You have HP tools. These are the first shimless design tools that were introduced to the marketplace. You may have ABS tools. ABS tools are tools designed to work with machines that have built in lubrication systems. Or you may have our newest EXP tooling, which is our insert design tooling. With these photos here, these are our HP large station tools. Okay, they will work whether the machine is air blow or non air blow. This tool here is an HP design tool that is non air blow. Okay, there is no grooves or channel. There's channels in it, but no portholes. Right here, you can see this tool here has a porthole here and a porthole here. That will allow oil and air to enter through the top of the tool and come out and lubricate the tool not, not only internally, but as well as externally. These tools here and here are our B-Station HP design tools. EXP tooling. This is our latest generation of tooling with our insert design approach. You have two different types of tools here. You have ones that will work with uh, full body tools as well as our HP design tools. The punch tips here are interchangeable whether you're using Wilson style, HP, or whether you're using full body inch style. This photo over here is showing our latest HPX assembly, which some of you may have, which is again, insert design, with the adjustment knob at the top that'll adjust in five thousandths per click. Guides. There are two types of guides. They're either rounds or shapes. And as you break down the rounds or shapes, you may have rounds with a gravity feed, which means that you're gonna have your operator manually loop, your operator will manually lubricate the tool, 
or you may have round ABS in which the tool will be lubricated through the machine. Same with the shapes. You will be lubricating the tool either manually or you'll be lubricating it through the machine. Our guides have internal as well as external keying, and when building the tools, selecting the right guide is crucial. Here I'm showing you the different guides that are out there in the marketplace today. This is in our half-inch station. This guide here is a round guide that is non-ABS. This guide here is an ABS tool. What you see here are these grooves and channels on this tool, as you can see here and here. This will tell you that this tool is an ABS design. So as your punch enters the guide, it will lubricate not only internally, but come out, oil and air will also come out through these portholes and, and lubricate the tool externally. Our latest generation guides indicate now as to whether the tool is in uh, gravity feed, which is this GF symbol here, or whether it is ABS by this uh, marking on the guide here. This will be a great assistance to you when building the tools. One thing you want to make sure of is that you do not confuse whether you're using an ABS or a non-ABS guide. It can cause damage to the punch as well as the machine, so be careful when selecting the right guide. Here I'm showing you where the internal key is. This will help line and get the guide seated properly. And then as you notice here, this guide designates that it's a gravity feed guide, so it will need to be lubricated internally. And it has two external keyways, one at zero and one at 90. Stripper plates. Stripper plates are there simply to hold the sheet in place when punching. Some are removable or replaceable. Others are a solid design that are part of the guide. Some stripper plates, as this one here, will need to have tools to remove the stripper plate. Others, such as this shown in our large station holder, do not require tools. There's simply a button to push here and one 180 degrees from that that you push the button. It lifts the stripper up into the removal process and to put the stripper back on, you simply press fit it down and it locks in place. Large station tooling. These guide assemblies have all the same components as the small stations. They all have spring packs, they all have punch bodies, they all have guides, they all have strippers. Early holder generations will require that tools be shimmed after sharpening. Current generations are a shimless design and will have external adjustment buttons. This is a picture of our large station HP guide assembly. We'll have a push button adjustment here, which will allow you to adjust your holder at three and a half thou per click. You have a removable guide, which there's a set screw here and one on the other side that will allow you to remove the guide to access the internal components of the tool, as well as perform maintenance on the tool as the tool is in the machine, after the tool is brought out of the machine to clean and remove any debris that might accumulate inside the guide. And here is the push button stripper release system that I talked about earlier. There are two types of large station holders out there. One that take HP design tools, as you can see here, and others that take either an M12, which is a metric design, or a half 13 design, okay? They're very similar in design, except the punch body. Uh, they do require different types of punch bodies. Knowing this will help you uh, build and assemble tools as you need to. With large station punches, you're basically breaking it down into three categories. You have a two inch station, a three and a half inch station, and a four and a half inch station. As I mentioned earlier, there are several types. You have HP design, you have a half 13 or a full body design. We have a metric design, which is M12, non ABS. And then there's an M14, which is a metric ABS design. Okay. Here's a chart where we're talking about specifications. This will help you as you get to learn the tools as far as knowing how, how much life you can gain from a tool, what the tool measurements are, what the tool types are, when tools need to be reordered. This here we're looking at is a half inch station tool. This A measurement is referenced right here, DIM A. And as you can see for all five stations, we include all of the brand new out of the box dimensions. Okay, same with the dies, all of the dies will have all of their dimensions referenced. 
On the B stations, it's the same. Same on the C, the D, and the E. The biggest number you need to know is that here on your A station, 4.643 is your brand new out-of-the-box dimension. When you measure a tool and it's at or below 4.223, it would be time to replace the tool. With that dimension, that's giving you a max grind life of 0 0.420. Now with that grind life of 0 0.420, that is dependent on, as we see here, 16 gauge material. So if you're a shop that, if in your shop, if you punch thicker than 16, 16 gauge material, you'll need to subtract the difference between the two materials and adjust your grind line. If you're a shop punching thinner than 16 gauge material, okay, you need to factor in that dimension and add to the grind line. That way you'll have a good idea of how much tool life you can achieve with the HP design tools, okay? If you're a shop that uses full body or metric tools, we've supplied a chart for here as well. The difference is in the dimensions and the grind line. Some of these holders require shims. Most of these holders here do not have as quite as large a grind length as the HP design. And with the shims, as you place them on the shoulders, will allow for two shims and the head nut to be adjusted at 60 thousandths, which will give you the 180 of grind life. All of your dies, though, have the same height and all of your dies will have the same end life. All thick turret dies have the same height as 1.181. And your grind life will range from 100 thousandths to a maximum of 120 thousandths. The die clearance is a very important, okay? When you're selecting the right die to make sure you have the right clearance because dies are a cr critical part of the punching process. Selecting the right tool for the job. When you're changing tools in a turret, things you should be aware of. What tools are already in the turret? What die clearance does the job require? What condu condition are my tools in? Are the tools properly adjusted? Okay, now we're gonna have a poll question. And this poll question will be, is designed to help your new operator figure out where his tools are. Currently, do you have a punch press layout chart in your shop? If yet, please select A. If no, please select B. If you don't know what this is, please select C. And the poll question is over in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. Okay, it'll take about 10 to 15 seconds for uh, this information to be registered, and then we'll look at the results. But with this, one of the benefits of the poll of the punch press layout chart can really help your, uh, your operator become organized. And uh, if you don't have these now, as we move forward, you'll see the benefits as to how they can help you and organize your shop. Hopefully we'll have those results here in a few seconds. All right, looks like we've got a result in and 62% of you have a uh, turret layout chart in your shop now, 25% of you don't and 12% of you are not aware of what they are. So let's move forward and hopefully we can uh, show everyone why they're of value, okay? Here's an example of a punch press layout chart. What this allows your operator to do is at any given time, he can look at any station and see what tool is in the machine. So as he's preparing to change tools, whether it's remove tools or add tools, he'll know whether the station is full, what's in the station, whether he needs to change the die, the punch, or both. This is just one example of a layout chart. Here's another example. This one requires a grease pen. It's a little bit easier to, uh, the stations are, uh, this machine has less stations, so it's a little, little bit easier to see the information. But either chart you use or whether you create one of your own can only help your operator, you as an operator, become better prepared uh, to do your job. Back to die clearances. General guidelines in selecting the right die clearance. Whether you're punching aluminum, mild steel, or stainless, each one of these materials require a different die clearance. Generally, aluminum will require uh, a die clearance of 10% of material. So as an example, if you're punching O60 material, a die clearance would be about six thousandths. Using that same formula for mild steel, I would move that to a nine thousand clearance. And if you're punching stainless, I would move that to a 12 thousand clearance, okay? 
This will allow your operation to run as smooth as possible and allow the tools to work as best they can considering the materials that you're punching. When you get to thicker materials, and by thicker materials, I would say anything that's thicker than, say, uh, 150 material, I would have these uh, factors increase by 5%. So if you're punching, say, 3 16 aluminum, I would probably move this from a 10% of material to 15. And the same for mild steel, I'd move that to 20 and stainless to 25. Okay. The other thing you want to do when you're getting ready to make a tool change is visually inspect the tools. Okay. How do they feel? Are the edges dull? Is there galling on the punch? Are your tools well lubricated? This is critical because in some of your shops, not having the tools lubricated can cause them to dry out and become stuck in the guides. It's similar to running your car with no oil, okay? The pistons will stop in the cylinders and lock up. That can't happen with your uh, punch press. Galling. For those of you not aware, galling is the material buildup on the punch. As we can see here, you can see the light colored highlights here as well as the darker on the edges. This is when material from what you're punching adheres to your punch tip, causes buildup, causes your tool to grow, as well as causes heat. Okay? Generally, aluminum is a more sticky sub, uh, substance and will attach to the tool easier. Also, keep in mind that if your tool is dull, it will gall quicker than a sharp tool. Okay? Die dimensions. As I've mentioned previously, all new dies are 1.181 in dimension. After sharpening your tools, adding shims will get the die back to original height. Die shims will come in three sizes. They come in 10 thou, 30 thou, and 60 thou. We recommend that you not stack more than two of the same shims, stack more than two shims of the same thickness at a time under the die. The reason they have a tendency to get lost or left behind. So as an example, if you were gonna, when you, once you get to 10 thousandths off this, so once it's down to 1.171, you would add a 10 thou shim. As you grind another 10 thou off, you'd add another 10 thou shim. As you get to 30 off, I would recommend you remove the two shims at 10 thousandths each and put in a 30. And then continue to that process until you get to 60 and then start over by adding the, six, the 10 and the 60 until you get there. Okay, I'm sure you see the, the concept. Shim boards. Shim boards are a great way to organize your shims. Okay, and let's the let you know where all of your shims are. It breaks it down by ten thou, thirty thou, and sixty thou each side. So you could have all of your tens there, your thirties there, and your sixties there, and then you have five different station sizes. This creates a central location and will help you organize your shims. Okay, forming tools. Basics of forming tools. Most common forming tools are in the B station. They are generally manufactured for a specific job. Most forming tools will have a spec sheet with detailed information about the particular tool. And forming tools can either be formed up or formed down. Sample plate here. What we have here is a special sample plate. And the idea behind this is this gives you an idea to look at how there are different forms, whether it be formed up as such or whether it be formed down. This will give you an idea to learn the different forms that your, your machine can run and opportunities that you can look at as, you, as jobs come across your machine. B-Station Forming Tool Assembly. This is a very similar tool to a piercing tool. The difference is instead of making a hole, we're going to make a form. So you have the same three components. You have your guide, you have your punch body, and you have your die. The difference is, is that it's going to make a form. And with this form, okay, this, this area here is a sample plate that comes with each tool or most of the uh, forming tools that, that you will uh, see. And this allows you to look at the tool and know that that form is what you should be seeing on your machine when running this tool. If you're not getting similar results to the sample plate, then you might wanna look at your setup and make sure everything is accurate. With the large station tools, the similar, they're very similar, except they're much different as, um, as far as the size goes. And their adjustment features have a, a push button or a plunger pull here and adjustment at the top of the tool, which is not visible here. Also, we do include sample plates for these tools. 
Here's a side view of how the tool actually works. As I mentioned earlier, tools can be form up or form down. This particular tool is a form up design. This tool is made for a specific material, and this tool is designed for a consistent, repeatable form. Now, what will happen in this process is that the punch, punch body here will come down, it will collapse this area here, which is the die cap, and then the insert, which is there, will make the form, which is here. And that process will repeat as necessary. But with this design, this allows your form to repeat on a consistent basis. This is a spec sheet or a front of job. With the front of job, what this, what this information tells you is very critical to your machine. It will let you know what the material for the tool was made for. This particular tool was made for 050 aluminum. It also tells you what machine. Some machines vary in height, whether you have all of the same machines in your shop or whether you have a couple different manufacturers, you should be aware of what machine type this tool was initially set up for. Also, what it tells you is the, the die height. So you can measure your die before putting it in the machine so you can know that approximately the die should be this height. Also, your tool height. The adjusted punch length is 8.020. These are critical information that will allow you to make the form so that it repeats as consistently as possible and does not damage the tool. Okay? Maintaining the tools. When to sharpen. How do I know when to sharpen the tools? Keys to alert you, the operator. Okay, three keys that I use with my guys is look, listen, and feel. You can visually inspect the punch and die. That's pretty obvious. The other thing is to listen for the slug going into the bin. That's key because these tools are designed that as the punch hits the top of the sheet, pushes through, and generates a slug, it should be entering the bin. So each time the punch goes down, you should hear the slug hitting the bin. If by chance you're not hearing that, that could give you an indication that your die is either dull or it's the wrong clearance and it's too tight. Either way, you should look, into your, uh, look at the tool and make sure it's functioning properly. The other thing you can do while the machine is running is grab some slugs from your slug bin and look at the quality of your slugs. Do they have a burr? Is there any distortion to the slug? This will also give you an indication that you could have a problem with the punch or die. Lastly is to rub your finger along the edge of the tool. How does it feel? Does it feel dull? Does it need to be sharpened? Is there any galling? These are all things that will indicate that it's time to make a tool change. Okay? With that, can you sharpen too often? I know most times the operator's going to want to run the machine. You want to run your machine as often as possible. You want to make as many parts as you can. But believe it or not, waiting too late to sharpen your tool could cause a problem. Here's an example. As we look above the arrow here, this operator, he waited until the tool was very dull and he needed to remove 40 thousandths at one time with sharpening. This gave him about 75 thousandths of hits before he needed to sharpen. The operator in the machine next to you, he decided that he was going to sharpen his tool and at 40 thousandths, at 80 thousandths, at 120, and at 160. And by removing 10 thousandths off each tool, he was able to get the same amount of tool life removed, or 40 thousandths removed from the same tool that you did, but the difference is, is that he's got 160 thousandths of tool life, or 160 thousandths of hits, whereas you've only had 75 hits, 75 thousand hits, and each of you have removed the same amount of material. So the lesson here is, is believe it or not, the more often you sharpen your tools on a regular basis, not taking a lot off, but just keeping them sharp, the longer your tools will last. And I know this chart might be hard to see and keep up with, and we'll be sending a PDF out of this chart after the uh, webinar to everybody who's registered with an email. Okay, sharpening guidelines. General recommendation is that you should be removing somewhere between four thousandths and ten thousandths should, uh, should return the tool to sharp. If you're having to take more than this off uh, on a regular basis, then I would decrease the number of hits between sharpenings. This will maximize your tool life. Another key point is, is that your grinding wheel should be dressed after uh, each tool is sharpened. 
The reason you want to do that is you do not want to transfer the swag that was removed from the previous tool onto this tool. It will generate heat, and it'll take longer to sharpen, and it also can damage the tool. Also keep in mind that frequent passes of five tenths to one thou per pass, uh, frequent passes of no more than five tenths to one thou per pass. Removal of more than that per pass can cause the tool to heat check. Okay, and what I mean by heat check is that all of punch tooling, whether it be a punch or die, is all heat treated material. If you cause the tool to, to generate higher heat than what is uh, normal, it can cause the tool to break down and change its heat treat properties. This will cause your tool to uh, become dull quicker or even crack and break. So looking at tools here, how do I know whether it's a good tool or a bad tool or whether the tool has been checked or not? So we have bad versus good sharpenings. The photo here is the result of a, of a tool that was heated uh, during the sharpening process. It may not have had coolant running over the tool during the sharpening process, um, an operator may have taken more off the tool than what was recommended per pass, or it could have been that the operator left the grinding wheel too long on the tool and caused the heat treat to change that way. Example over here is a tool that has been properly sharpened. It should come back looking brand new as if it was out of the box, giving you four good quality edges and allowing you to put the tool back in production as soon as possible. Okay. Another recommendation would be is to stone the punch surface. Running a stone along the edge of the tool will enhance your sharpening process. Tool steels do have pores, and as you uh, sharpen the tool, you open the pores. By running a stone along the edge will help to close the pores, thus reducing the areas where galling or other material adhesion could occur. Okay, here's a poll question for you guys. Have you had a punch press tooling seminar from Wilson Tool? If you have, please answer question A. If you have not, please answer with uh, answer B. And if you were not aware this was offered, please mark C. Now this is something that um, most of our uh, employees have done on a regular basis for most of their shops. The seminar today is the beginning stages of a tool seminar for new employees. Your, your tooling, uh, Sales engineer can come in and give you a more advanced seminars if you want to build on from what we've discussed today. So let's see how these are going to come out. Hopefully everybody's had one, but if not, we can definitely get it arranged for you. Should take just a few more seconds and then we should have the results. All right, so wow. Surprisingly, only 29% of you have had a, a tool seminar. 53% of you have not, which is quite surprising, and in 16% of, of you were not aware this was offered. I would suggest that whether we can, uh, you can contact your sales engineer, let them know that you were at the uh, webinar today and that you'd like to have them come in and do a hands-on tool seminar. I think it uh, be something that would definitely benefit your shop. They can look at your operation, look at your tools, go over some of the things that we highlighted today and get a hands-on seminar that will be more than beneficial to you and your operation. Okay, now it's time for the Q&A. So as you type in your questions, we'll go over them and see what we have, and I'll get, get back to you with answers as soon as you can. Pete, can you see those questions in the Q&A? Um, I'm looking for them. Let's see here. Okay, what, does a, what effect does punching speed have on tool life? Um, I'm not really sure punching speed has an effect on tool life. I'm looking at um, as far as um, when you're punching, the speed, if the tool is lubricated pretty well, you shouldn't have any problems with tool, uh, speed affecting your, your tool life. If the tool is not lubricated, it can dry up pretty quick. Um, do we provide seminars for trunk tooling? Yes, we do. Simply ask your sales engineer and he can get back to you. Um, recommendations for sharpening grind, tool sharpeners. Yes, uh, Wilson Tool offers a line of DCM grinders. It is a hands-free grinder that you can set up and uh, your operator can run it right by the machine. It's, uh, it takes about three minutes to sharpen large station tools. It's fully automatic. When it's done, it turns off. 
um, you can go on our website at wilsontool.com and look at uh, in the media section and see how the grinder operates. Uh, will the tool height tolerance chart be available as a PDF after the seminar? Yes, it will. It will um, we will be emailing that out. If you have uh, provided us with an email uh, address, we can get that to you as soon as possible. What die clearance would I recommend on 316 stainless? 316 being 187 material, I would probably start out at 037 and see how that works. And if it's still a little tight for your machine, I would increase from there. All right, next question. When looking at punching ability with regard to tonnage, does reverse tonnage from breakthrough need to be considered? Yes, um, I would look at any time you're punching material, whether it be aluminum, mild steel, or stainless, we do offer a tonnage chart that can look at the shape that you're um, punching and you can calculate the tonnage prior to using the tool to make sure that you're not over tonnaging the tool. Let's see. Next question is, what is the biggest issue you see with new operators? Um, probably initially out of the box is just them getting used to all the different tools. You know, if everybody had one tool type in their shop, it would be fantastic, but operators get confused. They have different punches, different punch types. Um, remembering, you know, to shim the dies each time, that is key because what happens is, is as we grind off the top and we don't shim on the bottom, uh, not having the tools to the right height can allow for slug pulling or perhaps having a miss, uh, miss strip. So, Getting the operators familiar with the tools as quickly as possible would probably solve a lot of their issues. Let's see. Does your die, does your clearance recommendation change for a cold rolled if it has a galvanized coating? No, I would rec I would not change that. I would keep it uh, the same at 15%. Um, if it becomes a little bit where it's starting to gall a little bit more because of the galvanized, you might want to open it up a little bit more. But other than that, I would still keep it at 15%. Okay, so any other questions? 